In this video, we ask two questions. One, is something strange going on regarding missing people in the national parks? And two, is the government trustworthy? I'll answer the second question right now. No, I'm Aiden Mattis and welcome back to The Lore Lunch. Essentially every time we make a Missing 401 video, someone will sit there, not watch the video, and take the time to comment something about us not giving David Politis credit. So the first segment of this video is solely about David Politis. I hope you're happy now. But you know what? To understand the Missing 411 phenomenon, you really do have to understand the guy behind it. Because not every missing person's case is a Missing 411 case, and not every Missing 411 case is even the most typical sort, the kind where somebody disappears in a national park. Sometimes we get cases like Brandon Swanson, who drove his car off the side of a dirt road and thought he was near a town he was 16 miles away from. Other times, a guy like Chris Tompkins is just walking along, you know, doing his job, and then just goes missing out of nowhere and nobody knows how or why. So when we're looking at something that seems generally centered around national park disappearances, how do these guys get involved? Why does David Politis consider them important? And what is the overarching connection in these cases? That's what we're gonna be going over in this video, is what makes a missing 401 case. And to start that off, we felt it necessary to discuss David Politis and his credibility and some of the attacks that are commonly levied against him. Central to both the arguments for David Politis and against David Politis and to Missing 411 as a whole is his background. Now, if you go to Wikipedia and search for David Politis, you'll notice that the editors have been hard at work trying to discredit the guy, trying to make it seem like he is not a reliable source, and one of their claims is that he relies too heavily on primary sources, which, as a historian, I laugh. <laughs> You serious? For those who weren't trained in the historical field, primary sources are one of our most important aspects. Primary sources are where you go to understand what the people experiencing something were actually thinking, what they were feeling. And then later on, later historians will go back and compile, and there's several steps to the historical process, but primary sources are an extraordinarily important one of them. But to be fair, Politis himself also isn't a historian. He claims to have gotten his undergraduate and graduate degrees at the University of San Francisco in the 1970s. I did look for yearbooks and commencement programs from the years he would have been at University of San Francisco. I couldn't find any, but I really have no reason to doubt that he went to school. In 1977, after graduating from college, he took a job in the Bay Area in law enforcement before transitioning to the San Jose Police Department in 1980. As far as Politis' claims go, he spent 20 years working in all sorts of different capacities. As a detective, as a SWAT officer, I think he even said he worked as a beat cop at one point, and then eventually the last job he worked for the police department was a court liaison officer. Now that is of course a primarily clerical position that can be filled both by somebody who is a non-sworn or a sworn member of the police force. In this case, we are led to believe by David that he was a sworn member. We know that he held this position because there are newspaper reports regarding him actually being charged with a crime while working in that position in his capacity as a court liaison officer. It seems that he was using city stationery to send out requests for autographs from various successful people in various different walks of life, and that this was considered fraudulent because he was claiming it was for a program he was running and the city said that program didn't exist. He was charged with a minor misdemeanor, falsely soliciting for a charity, but it was enough to make the news. Of course, Politis did not plead guilty to this. He didn't, you know, say, yes, I'm an autograph hound, that's what I was doing, I'm sorry. Instead, he said that these were supposed to be used as motivational tools for a class that he is known to have taught earlier that year, and that, I guess, he planned to teach again. I couldn't determine exactly what happened as a result of this. Again, we're talking minor misdemeanor, it's basically a fine and then an optional prison sentence for the judge. But most of the people who have brought this up have used it to say that Politis was convicted of fraud and fired from the police force. However, I can't determine whether he was fired from the police force at all, or I didn't see any evidence that he was ever actually convicted of the misdemeanor. Given that he was on his 19th year on the force and needed to finish out, probably just finish his last year at this point, 
it seems possible that this may have been one of those situations where the police department said, you know what, it's gonna be more of a media headache for us if we fire him than if we just kind of assign him to a desk job and let him ride out the last six months before he gets his pension and let him go on. I don't know exactly what happened. I had a hard time figuring that out because law enforcement records involving police officers not doing the right thing typically are hard to find. But what I can say for certain is that the argument saying that this is a black mark on his credibility as an investigator are pretty heavily exaggerated. The fraud was not him lying about an investigation. It was not him fabricating documents. It was him sending city letterhead to celebrities asking for autographs for a class he may or may not have been scheduled to teach. It really has no bearing on whether or not he's trustworthy as a reporter. Furthermore, Politis claims that he retired, that he left the force in 1997, rather than being forced to leave. He may have simply been allowed to resign, but like I said, there's, there's no records that I can find. It seems that his investigative chops were well known enough in the area because he was hired, according to him again, by an organization that wanted him to go out and either prove or disprove the existence of Bigfoot. Basically an unbiased, impartial, we're trying to figure out what the truth is behind Bigfoot, not a prove Bigfoot exists or a prove Bigfoot does not exist. It's also important to note that Politis' version of Bigfoot is much more similar to the Bigfoot that we have discussed on this channel. Either another branch of hominids that survived longer than we thought, or some sort of mixed species between humans and another hominid, something along those lines. It's not sort of the ape-like creature we see on all of those grainy movies from the 1960s. Now, apparently due to this project, while he was working on his Bigfoot evidence, which did result in a paper, by the way, I haven't read it yet, but I, I do intend to do a video on that paper. But while he was working on this project, he was approached by a couple of national park rangers. While off duty, these rangers informed him that they felt something was off about the disappearances in the parks, about the search and rescue efforts, that just something wasn't right. And again, this is all directly from David Politis. I cannot independently verify any of this as obviously he, he doesn't, you know, give us exact details about these rangers. But those rangers claimed that these disappearances weren't properly being investigated, that they were being shoved to the back or they were doing a you know, a quick summary investigation and then saying, you know what, I guess they just got off trail and they got lost. Sorry, too bad. Also told him that there was no national database for missing persons cases kept by the national parks and that the enforcement of these policies was kind of lackluster. It seemed as if the National Park Service at the very least was apathetic towards the number of people who were going missing and either turning up dead or never being found. That conversation occurred in 2009 and the first Missing 411 book came out in 2011. When it comes to Missing 411, the first mistake that a lot of people make is thinking that this is a title. While it is the title of the books and the documentaries, what that term actually is, is a profile. It is a specific set of markers that define a case as a missing 401 case, not a, a prescriptive term, it's a descriptive term. The name of David Politis' actual organization that focuses on this is the Can-Am Missing Project. As a case profile, Missing 401 describes a disappearance that fits a number of specific factors. It doesn't have to be all of the factors on the list. It can be most or even just half. And some of the cases that have been considered Missing 401 honestly really don't even have half of them. But for some reason, David decides to include them. And you know what? It's his profile. That's his prerogative. But as these factors go, it, it's as follows. One of them is total disappearance. Person is never found. That, you know, tracks could lead to a specific spot, stop, and then there's nothing there. Weird situations where they never find somebody. There's also people who are found in places that they can't reasonably have gotten to. That somebody ended up thousands of feet above where they were just a couple hours after disappearing. Somebody who went missing and was found a significant distance away with no real way of traveling it. Things like that. There's also unusual positioning of the body when the body is found. Someone will appear to have simply keeled over and died face down, which is odd, or women will be floating face down when typically women and overweight people due to body fat tend to float face up. They might be found in a previously searched area, somewhere that could have been searched two, three, even four times, and nobody saw anything only to return to it and the person happened to be there. 
Those who are found alive often experience amnesia. They say that they can't remember what happened to them or they, you know, black out or blank on something. In subjects that are found and not found alive, there's no cause of death. Nobody can adequately determine. They can, there, there's almost always a listed cause of death, but it's often very, very, very vague. There's also odd circumstances at the point of separation. Somebody, it'll be unclear when somebody disappeared or they vanish rapidly. Just in some way or another, there's not a discrete idea of how and when this person disappeared. Often subjects are missing clothing. It's generally their shoes, but a lot of the time they'll be missing something else as well. In the later cases, the more recent ones, there's the use of cell phones or more accurately, the lack of use of cell phones. People will have a charged phone and service and refuse to call for help for some reason. There's often cases where the dogs that they bring in are unable to track the scent of whoever is missing. And if, you're, if, if you get a bloodhound to a person's last known location and give them the scent, they're pretty good. Like they are, they are pretty good at tracking. In many cases, the initial search is hampered by bad weather. In cases where somebody went missing while with a dog, they'll often find the dog, but not the person. In terms of timing, most of these disappearances occur in the afternoons. There's the sex and age of the subject. Now we'll typically see that it is either somebody who is on the younger side, child through young adult, or somebody who is on the older side, somebody who is, you know, in their 50s and up. Another aspect that he notes is intelligence. People who go missing in these missing 401 cases are either high intelligence or low intelligence. There's not as many people in the middle in these cases, which of course is odd because the majority of people do fall into the average intelligence range. There's also other aspects like ancestry where Politis has noted that most of the people who go missing are German, or at least a, a plurality of them are of German descent. Subjects often suffer from some form of mental or physical disability as well, and that could be anything from, you know, having a, a metal hip to having depression. It really ranges. One that gets brought up a lot and one that gets criticized a lot is proximity to natural phenomena. Now, this one gets criticized mostly by people who are skeptics in general, not just skeptical of the missing 411 stuff, because people who are more religious or spiritually inclined might see natural phenomena like, you know, a, an underground spring or something like that, or caves, as something more than just a natural formation. Many mythologies, many religions see caves and mountains and things like that as portals to another realm. So for people who are more superstitious, this is going to seem like something legitimate. For people who are more skeptical, it's going to seem like something less legitimate. Sometimes there are even odd coincidences. Sometimes there are even odd coincidences regarding the person's name and stuff that's going on when they go missing. And additionally to all of that, people who are victims of foul play, who expressed an intent to disappear or an intent to harm themselves, are not considered. Now, I just gave you a, a pretty long list of possible factors in a missing 401 case, but not all of them are equally intriguing. Some of them are pretty explicable. Some really do make you scratch your head. For example, there are 49 million people of German ancestry in the United States, approximately 17% of the population. So when you're looking at the most commonly self-identified ancestry group, and it's also the most common missing 401 group, that's just because you're, you're getting statistical normality. You're seeing that, oh, well, 17% of people are of German descent and 17% of missing people are of German descent. That, that tracks. Now, as far as I'm aware, David never gives actual statistical percentages. There's also bad weather, which is more a factor of the search than the disappearance. If somebody went missing during bad weather, sure. But if somebody can't be found because the helicopters can't fly because there's a storm, that's not really mysterious or impacting the disappearance. It's impacting the search. There's also the timing aspect. People are most active in the afternoons. You're gonna see people on trails from, you know, early in the morning up through late in the afternoon, but the majority of people, the casuals, for example, are probably gonna be getting to the trail around 11 a.m. and being there until like 5 p.m. It's kind of like looking at the summer and saying, hmm, well, when ice cream sales go up, so do drowning deaths. Yeah, there's a correlation, but there's absolutely no causation. There's also the aspect of sex and gender, which is men are more commonly the ones who go missing. Men are also more commonly the ones who take risks and go on solo hikes and do stupid things. 
When it comes to age, we of course see that the people who are younger and the people who are older are typically the ones going missing, not people in the 30 to 49 demographic. It's very likely that the reason for that specific statistic is that when you add up all of the people who are under 30 and all of the people who are over 50, there's more of those people hiking than the people between 30 and 50. Obviously, since there's more people in that demographic, you're gonna see higher representation of that demographic in missing persons. There's also the disability aspect, which of course, if somebody is disabled, they're simply less likely to successfully hike, especially if it's a physical disability. Finally, we come to the suspicion of foul play. There are times when Politis says foul play wasn't suspected, when foul play was absolutely suspected. So now that we've gone through all of the stuff that is pretty explainable and you almost would expect out of any collection of missing persons cases, there's the stuff that's not exactly inexplicable, but it is usually weird. The things that aren't just gonna be given when you're studying a data set. This is what I would call the, the case by case oddities. For example, sometimes when somebody is found missing clothes, it's just paradoxical undressing. They're somewhere very cold, they get hypothermia, they feel that rush of heat as your body desperately tries to make you feel warm, and they start to take off clothes so that they don't feel hot anymore. So in some cases, yeah, the paradoxical undressing argument makes a lot of sense. That's not always. Sometimes people are missing clothes who really should not be missing clothes. Then there's the odd coincidences angle. Now, one of the ones that's mentioned is that when Elisa Lamb went missing, the NIH was using a set of tuberculosis tests called Lamb Elisa. Now, yes, weird, but also that test had been in use for several years already and would go on to be used for several years after. And it's not like it was some sort, it, it's often said that, you know, they were testing the Lamb Elisa. No, it's they were using the Lamb Elisa test. So yeah, a little weird, but not weird in the they're connected sense. There's also total disappearances, which are generally framed as extremely mysterious, but in certain cases, it is possible that the person just left the search area. Of course, with the natural phenomena in the area, he gives specifically granite, boulder fields, berry bushes, running water. These things are not necessarily odd, and especially in national parks, but there are certain folk beliefs, like I said before, about these being portals to other dimensions or the homes of unseemly creatures. So yeah, in some cases I would be willing to look at this and go, hmm, all right. There's also the case of Kenny Veach that involves a very specific cave and we'll get to that one later. But that's one of the ones where I'm like, okay, that's weird. When a subject is found in an area that's already been searched, it can definitely be weird. In some cases, however, there's a reason why that person might not have been seen at the time, but in many other cases, there's really no explanation. You have multiple people walk through an exact spot and then somebody just happens to be there. Oddly enough, in several cases regarding children, the child has been found alive in a spot that's already been searched. When it's adults, person's usually not found alive. Looking at the intelligence angle, people of lower intelligence are less risk averse and probably more likely to overestimate their own abilities. So it makes sense that you'd have people of lower intelligence going missing. Higher intelligence people are typically more cautious, although they also might be more arrogant. So it's, it's more weird when a high intelligence person goes missing, but there's also the possibility that, you know what, there were legitimate factors tied to their intelligence that caused them to go missing. Of course, with dogs, yeah, they can typically track a scent trail pretty well, but there are factors that can affect that. For example, if it rains heavily, if you're on a dusty like gravel road that's getting kicked up a lot, or if somebody walks into water for a long enough period of time. If you walk into a creek, walk 100 yards down the creek, still in the water, and then up the other slope, the dogs might not be able to find you anymore. Coming to the circumstances of the disappearance and the odd point of separation, this can be explained. Sometimes it's simply attributable to human error and somebody made a mistake, made the, took the wrong turn, they had a rendezvous point but they misunderstood, and then there's times where somebody really does just vanish. As far as the dog's angle, I actually don't think we've covered any cases that involved this one, but if somebody's hurt, it is possible their dog is just going off and looking for help. With amnesia, that can be caused by both physical and mental trauma. So if somebody went through a really trying and difficult experience, they might black out, they might forget about it just to save their own sanity, or they might have experienced some sort of head trauma that caused them to forget. So again, very case by case. Why is this person experiencing amnesia is an important question to ask. 
But then there's some genuine head scratchers. For example, the unusual position of a body. Keeping in mind that missing 411 cases are supposed to be those that do not have suspicion of foul play or self-harm, when somebody is found in a position that humans don't naturally fall into, it's weird. So somebody who is found face down in a creek. Not really a normal way to die. Or sometimes it's more of a chemical issue. Bodies will be found completely drained of blood, or they'll have some amount of some sort of substance in their bloodstream that they could not have feasibly ingested or injected. No cause of death also falls into these, because while sometimes a body is just too decomposed, there have been cases where somebody is found and they really can't say for sure how that person died. There's just no way to know. Implausible location also falls here. People who went missing and were found a place they could not possibly have gotten on their own. There are a few cases that we'll talk about today that fall into that bracket, but that's probably one of the most confusing ones because unless there's an explanation, like with Danny Philippitis, people have suggested, oh, well maybe he went into a fugue state and just forgot everything. Sure, that could explain how a man who was in New York ended up perfectly healthy in San Francisco, but it doesn't explain how somebody who went missing at 5,000 feet of elevation is found at 11,000 feet of elevation. It just doesn't cover that. Finally, there are the cell phones. Now, obviously, this really only applies to things in the last 20 years, but there are a number of cases where somebody had a charged cell phone, somewhere they even had a GPS as well, and did not call for help even when they had service. So that means that either they deliberately chose not to use their cell phone, or that they never realized they were lost, which in some of these cases seems pretty improbable. And when I was compiling all of this information, thinking about, you know, what's the best way to present a sort of meta-analysis of missing 411 cases, I decided to categorize cases based on how well they fit the criteria for missing 411, the actual profile points, and how accurately David Politis described them. What immediately becomes clear, trying to create some sort of tier list here, is that this is really more of a set of guidelines than anything. Some cases fit a lot of profile points, some cases fit very few profile points, and amongst those profile points, some are more important than others. You could have a case that only fits four of the points, but they're all the really weird ones, like an implausible location, they didn't use a cell phone, we can't figure out how they died, things like that, which scream something weird happened here, and you can have cases that fit almost every single profile point, but really aren't that mysterious because there was a piece of information left out that should have been left in. So it breaks down into four categories, I find. There are the cases that actually do have an explanation and have been solved. Aren't that many of those, but they do exist. There's the cases that could be something unusual, but the evidence is weak and it's more likely that we're just missing one key clue or another as to what actually happened. Then there's the cases that have strong evidence of something strange happening, not something that's necessarily inexplicable, as in, if another piece of evidence were to be found, that would suggest that, you know what, this was mundane, but it's weird enough that you start to ask questions about whether the official narrative makes sense here. And then finally, there are the true missing 411 cases. The ones that defy reason, that can't be explained, and that just really, no matter how you look at it, there's no possible way this person went missing. Obviously, it would not be very fun if I started with the most intriguing cases, so I'm gonna start with the cases that have been solved, that we know what happened, or at least that we're pretty positive we know what happened. It is important to note that in some cases, when Politis published the story, his version of it, there were details that had not yet been released or even uncovered, and so we can't really fault him for getting it wrong, for calling something that was eventually solved a missing 411 case, because when he looked at it, it wasn't solved. And Bobby buys up is one such case. Bobby fit a whole bunch of profile points. He was young, male, disabled, an improbable location, no firm cause of death, the area had already been searched, dogs couldn't track him, there was an unknown point of separation, he was near a boulder field when he was found, and he went missing late in the afternoon. Obviously, that's a considerable number of points, but you'll notice only a couple of them are in the intriguing category. The 10-year-old Denver boy was staying at a Catholic boys camp called Camp St. Mallow, just a few miles south of Estes Park, Colorado. And as far as anyone knew, between 5.30 and 6 p.m. on August 15th, 1958, Bobby was walking back from fishing at a little creek just down below the main camp area. 
But somewhere between Cabin Creek and that main camp area, Bobby vanished. Nobody knew where he was, he just simply disappeared. And a very, very intense, large search effort was launched immediately. And because Bobby's dad was a, a, I believe, a master sergeant at a local Air Force base, basically the entire Air Force came out to help in the area. Despite a full week of legitimate professional search, and then several months of people just kind of keeping an eye on it, checking it out, seeing if anything turned up, Bobby was not found. In fact, Bobby would remain missing until July 3rd, 1959, when Neil Hewitt and two other counselors leading a group of campers on a hike up Mount Meeker stumbled across some of Bobby's remains. These remains, however, were 2,500 feet and approximately three miles from Bobby's last known location. And when I say that they were approximately 2,500 feet, I mean up, like up the mountain. In fact, Bobby's remains were so far up the mountain that had he stopped and turned around at the place he was found, he would have been able to see the camp because he was above the tree line at 11,000 feet. And for decades, this puzzled everyone involved. Nobody could come up with a good explanation for how and why Bobby went from Cabin Creek to just simply perishing above the tree line. At least that was until 2019, when a clerical abuse scandal hit the papers, and suddenly people started to look at the Catholic boys camp where he went missing in a different light. Of course, today it's pretty common knowledge that in organizations both religious and secular that deal with children, there is a pretty staggering amount of abuse going on. In 1958-1959, even if there were rumors and whisperings, Nobody really believed it, and we've covered cases from the 1950s before involving missing children and abused children, like the Boy in the Box case, where, yeah, it's, it's tragic, and today we would look at the circumstances and go, well, this kid was obviously being abused, but back then, they didn't really have the cultural understanding that this was something to be on the lookout for. So when Denver news crews went out looking for the story, the, the missing details on Bobby Bezup's case, what they found was that Bobby had not disappeared while on a fishing trip. No, Bobby had run screaming out of the main lodge after an interaction with, of all people, Neil Hewitt. And then, after the story was released, a man came forward who possessed a child skull for what appeared to be a 10-year-old boy that had been given to his dad by one of the priests working at Camp St. Mallow who told his father that this was the skull of a missing child. Why the man who came forward's father never went to the cops and said, hey, my priest friend gave me the skull of a missing child, I will not know. It does seem that the man who eventually turned the skull in had been looking to turn it into somebody to help with the investigation, but had not done so yet because he was afraid he would be blamed. So, looking at all of the available evidence in 2023, it was pretty obvious to me that Bobby was abused by one of the counselors who were all seminarians or priests, and that since it was taboo to even talk about such things at the time, and Bobby was also deaf and had a hard time communicating with anybody except his parents vocally, it seems very likely that Bobby was abused, ran away, and died of exposure, or that he was abused, ran away, got caught, and then was brought to his final resting place. Although carrying a dead 80-pound child 2,500 feet and three miles up a mountain would be one hell of a feat for any one man to do alone. It's not impossible, but if you're, if you're not like an experienced backpacker, that's a lot of weight to be carrying. So while this case is pretty much, it can be considered solved, Politis came out with his version of it before 2019, and especially before the case actually broke regarding Bobby, I believe in 2021. So you can't fault Politis for getting this one wrong because there were details he didn't know about. And I mean that sincerely, because basically every bit of information about this case that involved Bobby as a victim of abuse came after 2019. There were earlier news reports, but none of them suggested that. This makes up a pretty small minority of Politis' cases. Most of them are legitimately unsolved, but it's important to note that every once in a while, there is one that does have a reasonable and concrete explanation. So after the category of solved, we come to the cases that have weak evidence that they're unusual, more evidence that something mundane happened, like foul play, human error, an animal attack, or health issues. One case among these that stands out is Aaron Hedges. Aaron had so many missing 411 profile points, 
when he went missing. And he went missing on a hunting trip with two friends in Montana's Crazy Mountain Range. They were out looking for elk. Unfortunately, on the hike in, they had a mule wreck, which resulted in most of Aaron's camping gear being lost. His friends Joe and Greg didn't want him to just head home, so they went back, got some spare gear, not quite what Aaron had, you know, they didn't have a, an extra tent for him, but they had some blankets and a sleeping roll. And you know what, Aaron, Aaron put up with it for a couple of nights, but then decided that he really wasn't having this, it wasn't for him, he needed more comfort. So the 38 year old was gonna hike about seven miles up and around a bend to a cache that he and his friends had all put together up at Sunlight Lake. Joe and Greg that morning had decided to go up and kind of survey the area, see if they could see any good hunting spots. And sometime in the morning they saw Aaron shuffling around at the campsite and then they checked in with him at noon when they were told that he was still on his hike. And then again at 6 p.m. Now here's the thing that happened. When they first checked in with him, Aaron said he thought he had gotten off the trail somewhere and might be lost. The second time, he sounded very far away. He said he was definitely lost and he was not going to make it back that afternoon. What they were asking him was, hey, we, we, got, a, we got an elk, can you come help us? And Aaron was basically like, I can't, I don't know where I am. Now they expected that Aaron would turn around and end up meeting them back at one of their campsites or even at their cars down the trail further. Thing is, Aaron never showed back up and after three days with no contact from him, Joe and Greg just left. Oddly enough, they themselves did not call in the missing persons report but rather called Aaron's wife, asked if Aaron was alive and then had her file the missing persons report. Not sure why they didn't file it themselves, not sure why they didn't go looking for Aaron in the first place, but a pretty big search was launched and unfortunately nothing was found. And Joe and Greg throughout this entire period kept doing sketchy stuff and saying suspicious things that made it seem like they had something to do with Aaron's disappearance even though by the end of it, it very much seemed that they didn't. The reason for that being that Aaron's remains were eventually found 15 miles east of where he originally went missing and not by anyone looking for them. It was actually just some people at a ranch on a ride. And like I said, Aaron was an absolute laundry list of missing 4 one profile points. To read you off most of them, he was missing his boots, his cell phone had been working and had service, nobody determined a cause of death because he wasn't supposed to be there in the first place, and his bones were scattered about so nobody could tell for sure, some of them had even been gnawed on, so they just said exposure. There was no reason for him to be where he was, so implausible location. There was also an active ranch in view from where he apparently died, like he could have just walked down the hill and gotten help. Dogs couldn't track him. By the time he was actually found, foul play was no longer suspected. And he went missing in the afternoon. So that's almost all of the profile points, except the ones for people who are found alive or with dogs. What is left out, and I'm not sure if this was left out of the Missing 411 The Hunted movie by Politis himself, or by a director or producer, but Aaron was detoxing from alcoholism. And Politis knew this, the police knew this, Aaron's friends knew this. Basically everybody involved in this story knew this, except you, the audience. And on top of detoxing from alcoholism, which by the way, eventually it comes out in the police reports of this case that there was alcohol on the trip and it appears that Aaron was drinking it. He was also on benzodiazepines to treat the withdrawal symptoms, which are very commonly similar to anxiety and depression symptoms. So they gave him drugs that would treat anxiety and depression while he got off of the alcohol. The problem was he wasn't getting off of the alcohol and he also wasn't taking his meds at the appropriate times or uh, consistency or even the right dosages. So he was taking the wrong amount of his benzodiazepines and also drinking, which in and of itself is dangerous. And both of those things when done together can really screw up your mental state. They, they, can, they can turn all this into some soup. It, it's a temporary soup, but trust me, it's a soup. I've been there. But is it a tasty soup? It's not a tasty soup. So while his exact point of separation, and we're gonna call this the point at which he realized he wasn't in the right place, is unknown. It seems pretty clear that his altered mental state, a that he, you know, him being on both pretty intense drugs and alcohol, these likely caused him to miss his turnoff or get confused or lost. There's any number of ways in which this could have affected him. It could have simply been that he was looking for a certain landmark, couldn't see it, got frustrated because he was on a cocktail of things that don't mix and then continued on in the wrong direction because he was feeling too stubborn. Having been on that kind of medication myself for an anxiety disorder, yep, that sounds about right. As for the fact that he was missing his boots, 
Well, hunters will typically hike in boots and then switch to either moccasins or sneakers to stalk because they're quieter. So in this case, a ton of stuff is accounted for, including why he was missing his shoes and how he ended up so far off track, but there are still certain questions, you know, why did he at no point realize that if he just turned around and walked back the way he came, he would find his friends? Why did he have a revolver with three spent rounds in it? Questions like that, where it, also, why did he have a campsite at one point that had two separate fires? There, like I said, there's a bunch of weird aspects here, but for the most part, it seems like the, the significant stuff, why he disappeared, why he was missing clothes, how he ended up over there, they're accounted for if you also assume that he made some bad choices. Another case in this vein is Chris Tompkins. Chris was a young man, about 20 years old, and of pretty small stature. He was about 5'6 and 120 pounds, and he was working as a surveyor on a four-man crew that he had actually he had carpooled with them to the site in Ellerslie, Georgia, just outside of his home city of Columbus. Around 1.30 p.m. that day, one of Chris's co-workers, allegedly, noticed that Chris was not where he was supposed to be, even though just minutes earlier, he had been only 50 feet away. The crew claimed that they searched for Chris for about half an hour before calling the foreman's wife, for whom Chris's mother worked as a babysitter. They didn't call Chris's mom, they didn't call the authorities, they called the foreman's wife. And it appears she did not call the authorities or Chris's mom either. Why do I say that? Because Chris's mom didn't find out for three more hours until 4.30 p.m. when she was told, hey, by the way, your son's been missing for several hours. And she called the police asking for help, only for the police to tell her, uh, yeah, well, he hasn't been missing for 24 hours yet. He's an adult, so you gotta wait. You can't just call in a missing persons report for a grown man. By the way, that is now no longer the case, I think, in any U.S. state as a result of the Brandon Swanson case, which we also have covered and we'll be covering later in this video. But basically, Brandon's law is that you, you can call in a missing persons report for a person of any age at any time, regardless of how short they've been missing for. Somebody could, you know, be gone for half an hour and you can call in a missing persons report. However, because that became law in 2009 and this event happened in 2002, the police were unwilling to help until he had been missing for that full 24 hours. Nonetheless, Chris's family went out and started looking for him, but they did not find him. Instead, they found one of his boots on the other side of a barbed wire fence, a piece of blue fabric, which seemed to be from Chris's pants in the barbed wire fence, and a pile of change and some of Chris's tools laying on the ground on the trail that he had been taking on, on the side of the fence he had been on. The other boot was not there. It's also important to mention that his co-workers claimed they looked for him, and yet they found none of this themselves. Eventually, of course, Chris's other boot was found several miles away on somebody else's property, but it turned up no leads. This one also fits a considerable number of profile points. Chris had a unclear point of separation. He seems to have just randomly vanished. His body was never actually found. He was missing his boots. Dogs couldn't track him very far. He was male, early 20s. He went missing in the afternoon. So that's a bunch of missing 411 profile points. I actually might be missing one or two. But there is a, a pretty big missing piece in Politis' version of the story. If his coworkers are to be believed, Chris did not tell any of them he was leaving. He left wearing only one boot, climbed over a barbed wire fence, deposited the boot several miles away, never retrieved his car and didn't leave his car keys, and on top of all of that, he was never found anywhere ever again. So if all of that seems odd to you, it seems odd to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation as well, who consider this an open case and are still investigating it. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, foul play is very suspected in this case. They just can't decide who did the foul play. Still, there is enough weird going on here that maybe, maybe his coworkers are telling the truth and they really don't know what happened to Chris, but it seems more likely that foul play was involved. So, is it possible this was something strange? Yes. Is it likely it was foul play? Yes. We can also take the case of Charles McCuller, which was inexplicably muddied by David Politis, including a weird detail about feet and pants. That detail would have been fine, in fact, it actually makes the case considerably more interesting, if it weren't fictional. And I'll, I'll explain what that detail was in just a moment, but first, Charles McCuller Jr., Chuck, as he, as he called himself, was on a solo bus trip across the United States to do some photography, seemingly on a gap year before college, and apparently the kid had some pretty intense survival training 
And given his father's connections and the amount of times that senators actually did ask the FBI for help because his dad asked them to, it seems likely that his dad had some pull within the government for some reason and also a whole bunch of weird survival skills. I will let you draw connections. I believe he was in the army at one point. I don't know his exact role. All I know is that he and Chuck are both buried at Arlington. So given his pretty impressive survival skills, the fact that he had been doing this for several months already, and the amount of connections that he had, nobody expected that Chuck's trip to Crater Lake, Oregon, was going to be that big of a problem. He hopped on a bus from Eugene, he had been staying with friends, he was gonna go to Crater Lake for a couple of days, take some pictures, and then come back. However, he was gone for a couple of days, and then also another day, so his friends said, you know what, that's weird, we should probably call the cops. And they did. An investigation was performed, however, there was absolutely some weirdness going on with that. If you want the details, go watch our video on Charles McCuller. It's one of our best ones, personally, I think so. But where that investigation ended up was that Chris was last seen on a highway northwest of the park, but nobody knew when or how he'd gone from there into the park. All they knew is that Chris went missing somewhere between that spot on the highway and the entirety of Crater Lake National Park, which is large. And he was eventually found after a ton of pushing and prodding at the government from his father and his dad actually flying out to Crater Lake, spending months searching the park for him and working hand in hand with rangers. When he was found, nobody could explain it. To quote the FBI documents that cover this case, Prior to the discovery of his remains, Crater Lake Park Rangers more than once expressed the opinion that without skis or snowshoes, Chuck would have been unable to travel into the park more than a mile or two at most before becoming exhausted. Now, why is that? Because the snow ranged from three feet to eight feet deep in the areas he was in and covered all of the trails. There was nowhere he could walk off of the main road that was a simple packed down trail. Also included in the FBI documents about this case is the information that park rangers didn't even bother to search the western side of the park because when Chris was there, it would have been so impassable that they did not consider it likely he would be there. In fact, the wording was that they believed it impossible that anybody could get there on foot. Why is that? Well, because Chuck's remains were found 12 miles into the park, not just inside the north entrance, not just inside the south entrance, he took the north entrance, by the way, which was closed. Uh, they were found 12 miles in and a mile from the nearest road or trail. However, the nearest trail would have been covered in exactly as much snow as everything else, and the nearest road was not one that he could have gotten to from the north side of the park. So he has to have hiked through the park and, and for miles, miles and miles. In fact, Chuck's location was so improbable that even after the discovery of the body, and I quote, Rangers remained puzzled as to how he had gotten there without equipment for travel in the snow. Going by all of the information I compiled, it seems that Chuck would have had to traverse eight miles in three foot to eight foot deep snow with no snowshoes, and some of that snow was fresh. And I want to reiterate that the people investigating this, the people whose job it is to work and live and breathe Crater Lake National Park thought it was impossible for him to get there. So when we look at this case, there are a lot of missing 411 profile points. We have improbable location, odd body position, young, male, uncertain point of separation, so to speak, high intelligence, no known health issues, foul play not suspected, no known cause of death. Well, they basically said exposure, but that seems to just be the go-to in these cases. Uh, dogs couldn't track him, and on top of all of that, he had intense winter survival training. And I said I would mention that detail that is muddying regarding how his body was found that Politis includes that I could find no official record of. In fact, his father seems to contradict it. Politis says that Chuck's pants were found sitting on a log with his socks still inside the pants and his feet bones still inside the socks, but his torso wasn't there. That is not in any of the reports. Not, not a single one. Now, all of that said, I don't personally think this is a supernatural one. I think that this is a case of foul play and that the FBI just simply refused to do their jobs because everything about it screams foul play, including his location. Now, is it possible that something else weird happened? Yes, but that's why I put this one in the weak evidence of something strange, strong evidence of foul play category. And finally, in this category, we come to Eloise Lindsay. Eloise was on a solo hiking trip on the Appalachian Trail when she 
felt like she was being followed. She was, of course, she was solo, but she had written George Lindsay and Eloise Lindsay on the book so that anybody following her would assume she had a man with her. A few days into her hike, she determined that people behind her were following her and talking about her after hearing a couple of men who were wearing uh, orange, like, construction vests saying that there was a woman ahead of them walking fast up the hill. Now, of course, that could have just been them talking to their buddies over the radio and saying, ah, yeah, there's somebody above us. Or they could have been talking about her because they thought that she was vulnerable. It's hard to tell. Eloise wasn't taking any chances, and rather than continuing to hike and hoping that she found shelter and company soon, she just ditched the trail. In fact, she was so convinced that she was in danger that she dropped her pack, too, to move faster, and that had about seven days' worth of food in it, and she chose to go off into the wilderness in the 1980s with nothing. Furthermore, she claimed that the two men chased her off the trail and then followed her through the woods for days, and she was just living off of whatever she could find. At one point, she found a cache of pastries that she started eating, and these will apparently be left either to attract bears or as a present for other hunters. I couldn't totally grasp the whole pastry box in the woods thing, but apparent, according to everybody on the video, this is actually pretty normal practice, so okay. But she was eventually found by a hunter 12 days in. Eloise's case fits some of the criteria, such as age, time of day, and an unclear point of separation. Nobody's really sure exactly when or where she got off the trail, or what was going on for all of that time. But this is more a story about what Eloise thought was in the woods with her. She thought she was being chased, and that's what makes it weird. And a lot of people would be quick to say, oh, well, you know, it could just be paranoia, she could have been experiencing some sort of mental health crisis. But when you look at the legends of Appalachia and the trails and the wilderness around it, there's a lot of stories about tree men and wild men and strange stuff going on out there. So it's, it's not impossible for something weird to have been going on. I personally think that those stories aren't totally made up and that there have been circumstances of wild men living out in the mountains. That, that doesn't surprise me at all. There, even a little bit. There's also the fact that later on, Eloise was never diagnosed with any sort of paranoia or panic disorder or anything that would have explained her having the psychotic break that led her to think that people were chasing her through the woods. So this one, there's not a ton of evidence to support what she said, but circumstantially, and considering the folklore of the area, I'm inclined to give, give it the possibility that something weird happened, if not say that I'm convinced. And then we come to the cases that have strong evidence of something strange happening. Kenny Veach is one that comes to mind. He was an avid hiker and kind of an oddball, but in a charming, harmless sort of way in that his YouTube channel is mostly things he invented and was trying to pitch Shark Tank style. In a YouTube comment section, however, the Las Vegas resident described that on a hike, he had come across a strange cave. And this was not his video, this was someone else's video about UFOs and aliens in Area 51, but he mentioned that while hiking near Nell's Air Force Base, he came across a strange M-shaped cave. And he was very clear that this was not just sort of M-shaped, it, it was like a capital M. And that as he approached it, he felt his body begin to vibrate and that it made him very uncomfortable, and he just decided to leave. That, that this was not for him, it was not something he needed to engage with, and you know what, I'm going home. Now, there are tons of theories about what that cave could have been, if it was even real. Some people, like myself, have said active denial system, some have said nuclear waste storage, some have said supernatural stuff. There's any number of things this could possibly be, but it, it seems that if it was there, or if it was real, there was something in that cave. It's hard to say what, but Kenny was convinced. And I know he was convinced because when people accused him of lying in that same comment section, he set out to find his cave again on video to prove it was there. Unfortunately, when he filmed this, he didn't find the cave, and there were just more and more accusations that he was making it up for clout, he was lying, he was just trying to get some internet fame. But Kenny doubled down. He was adamant that this cave was there and it was real. And in fact, if you watch the video, there are people who comment saying they think they actually see the cave and that Kenny just didn't recognize that that's what it was, that maybe it caved in or it had been deliberately covered. But the way Kenny describes the cave and the cave that people are pointing to, I don't, I don't think they line up well enough. Unwilling to be called a liar, however, Kenny determined that he was going to go out again and he'd be going solo for three days, so he'd be staying out in the desert 
in a tent by himself and that he was going to that canyon where he initially found the cave and if he didn't find it, he was gonna search every canyon for the cave until he found it. He said that this specific trip would take him about 40 miles and that he would return back, but he didn't take his camera this time. All he set off with were his cell phone, his nine millimeter handgun, and his camping gear. When Kenny did not return three days later, a search effort was launched, but nobody could locate Kenny. All they were able to do was find his truck and looking at his former videos, kind of figure out, all right, well, here's where he seems to have been going. They find a mine shaft that he actually stands next to in his original video on this topic. And at that mine shaft, they found his cell phone. Kenny was not in the mine shaft. They looked, it's not a very deep mine shaft. It's like maybe 15, 20 feet deep and mostly collapsed. So if Kenny was in there, they would have found Kenny. In fact, despite having the exact route Kenny planned to take available to them via his older videos and his YouTube comments, nobody found him. And also nobody found the cave. The fact that nobody found the cave is actually fascinating because since Kenny disappeared, since this whole story became viral, people have gone, dozens of people have gone to try to find the cave. In fact, that's just the people who recorded themselves doing it. There are probably more people who went out to find the cave and didn't and never filmed it. Oddly enough, none of those people have found the cave, though some have claimed to. I've watched the videos, I don't agree with them. Um, some of them have claimed to find the cave. Nobody's found Kenny. And the thing is, you, Kenny had a shiny handgun with him. In the hot desert sun, if he went missing above ground, there's a good chance that you'd see the handgun. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and say that you would see the handgun for sure, just if somebody's out carrying a, a nine millimeter, depending on what kind it is, it, it might put off a pretty significant reflection. Not long after this, however, a woman came forward claiming to be Kenny's girlfriend, and she said that she thought he had ended his own life. She claimed that Kenny had suggested that he had thoughts of doing so, that he would be, you know, okay doing so, and that she'd be okay too if he went, that, you know, everything would be fine. Problem is, Kenny's relatives and Kenny's behavior don't back that up. He doesn't seem like he was considering ending his own life. He doesn't seem to have presented signs of that to anybody but his girlfriend. And if there's anyone who is typically suspected when someone goes missing, it's usually the spouse or significant other, the person who has the most to gain from that person disappearing. Now, the evidence is that Kenny had been treated for depression in the past, but being depressed is not the same as being suicidal. And his argumentativeness and his stubbornness regarding proving this cave's existence also imply that he, he had a certain purpose in life that he was dedicated to. Even if it was just for a short period of time, Kenny was finding that cave. His case also fits several major points here. It's unknown where he would have gone off track. He was male. He had a mental health issue, depression. He was near caves, that's natural phenomenon. And most importantly, he was never found. And as I said, that last one is strange for a very specific reason, that reason being the number of people who have tried to find the cave and know his exact route. So many people have taken his exact route and nobody's found Kenny or the cave. I just need to reiterate that. That's weird. And it's, it's not the same sort of case as Tom Messick, where the guy disappeared, but he disappeared in the woods and there was an abandoned sawmill and sinkholes. And at one point when we were investigating it, my foot sank ankle deep into the mud and I probably could have sunk further if I had not pulled it out. So with Tom Messick, there's a bunch of stuff that could have happened. With Kenny, it's the desert. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not sorting through bushes and things like that looking for somebody. If somebody died, they're gonna be pretty out in the open unless they went into a cave. And I just, I need to reiterate how weird it is that very rarely does somebody leave an exact guide of how to follow them and still disappear completely. So when we look at Kenny's case, there's basically any individual factor can be explained, except the other factors in the case tend to contradict. So nothing ends up with a, a neat concrete explanation here. And it really seems more like something odd did happen, especially factoring in the vibrating cave. We can also look at the case of Garrett Bardsley, who was on a camping trip with his Boy Scout troop at the age of 12. He was fishing with his dad, his socks got wet, and at first he figured he'd be okay. Then he got uncomfortable and told his dad, you know what, I wanna go back and swap out my socks and shoes. I'll be right back. It'll take me 15 or 20 minutes. So Garrett grabs his fishing rod and walks himself back to camp. Don't ask me why he brought his fishing rod. I don't know. All I know is that the reporting suggests he brought his fishing rod. About halfway of the 150 yards between where they were fishing and the camp itself, there was a bend, a, a turnoff, you might say, and Garrett initially missed the turnoff, but his dad yelled back to him, hey, Garrett, 
you missed the turn, and Garrett went down the right path. So there were really only about 75 yards for Garrett to cover where his dad couldn't see him. And this is an area that is lightly forested. It's actually pretty open. There's boulder fields all over the place. Your voice is going to carry. It's not, it's not like you're in dense woods where it's going to bounce off or get absorbed. When we were up in New York, again, on the Tom Messick case, when we were up in New York, I was 100 yards into the trees speaking at this volume and Aiden could hear me. So if Garrett had called for help, somebody would have heard him. Also, Garrett should have been able to hear the other Boy Scouts, especially after going around the bend, because, like I said, they could talk and be audible at that distance. Also, if you've ever been on a Boy Scout camping trip, you know that Boy Scouts make a considerable amount of noise. However, when Garrett was not back from his, again, this is a 300 yards round trip, when he wasn't back in 15 or 20 minutes, his dad decided to go back and see what was going on. You know, maybe Garrett just decided he didn't want to come back and go fishing. Maybe he got distracted. 12-year-old boys, you know how they are. He gets back to camp and he goes to ask, you know, has anybody seen Garrett? Garrett never made it back to camp. So somehow, with just 75 yards between Garrett and the Boy Scout camp at around 8.30 in the morning, while carrying a fishing pole, he just vanished completely. Just gone. Never showed up. Never, never screamed. No, apparently... If, if the argument is he got lost, then he got lost in the, the most unreasonable way possible. Obviously, a 12-year-old Boy Scout going missing, and especially in the Uintah Mountains and just outside of Provo and Salt Lake City with an entire Mormon Boy Scout troop, you had the Mormons out in force. Because if there is one thing Mormons know how to do, it is protect their communities. So the search for Garrett was pretty, pretty intensive. Unfortunately, no Garrett was found. And there are a number of missing 401 profile points involved as well. Garrett was young, male, near a boulder field. He completely vanished. And most importantly, the point of separation makes no sense at all. He just disappears. He is smack between his father and a whole troop of Boy Scouts and somehow did not alert anybody if something bad was happening to him. He was even corrected about being on the wrong trail and put onto the right trail again with just 75 or so meters to go before he hit the camp to a camp he probably could have seen at that distance, let alone heard. So Garrett was out of sight for just 15 minutes and never out of earshot, and somehow he disappeared. And not his clothes, his fishing pole, nothing of Garrett's was found as this search spanned out over a pretty large and broad area, anywhere they thought Garrett could have gotten to. There are really only a couple of possibilities for what could have happened. He might have been attacked by a predator, maybe a mountain lion, something that tends to kill quickly, but then would he have not dropped his fishing rod? He also may have been kidnapped by a human being, but the problem with that is how did he not scream? How did nobody notice the weird man stalking around the Boy Scout camp? And how did somebody walk out of the mountains with a small child slung over their back and nobody noticed it? There's really only a couple of options, which is if somebody kidnapped him, they never left the mountain, which would mean that somebody was living up in the mountains alone, which I would be willing to call a wild man, or he was attacked by an animal and somehow didn't drop anything he was carrying and didn't scream, which seems very unlikely to me. So in the case of Garrett Bardsley, very little evidence that something mundane happened, considerable evidence that something weird happened. Can also discuss Eric Lewis, who may have been a victim of foul play, but if he was, it was such an absurdly elaborate setup that nobody even considered it to be possible or likely. On July 1st, 2010, Eric Lewis and his friends Don Storm Jr. and Trevor Lane began ascending the Gibraltar Ledges route on Mount Rainier. Now, that route is only recommended for winter climbs because the ice needs to be at a certain stiffness. Other than that, you're taking a pretty big risk going up there, and as I said, it was July. As well, the weather was pretty horrific with about only five feet of visibility in some places. On top of that, of course, there are the high winds that are common to being 13,000 feet up on a mountain. And that route ascends 9,010 feet, that is 2.75 kilometers, and requires crampons, ropes, and axes to complete, and helmets as well are recommended. Around 14,000 feet, Don and Trevor decided to take a break, which would give the third climber on their rope line, Eric, time to catch up. Problem was, Eric never caught up. They sat there for several minutes and Eric did not show. So they decided to kind of yank on the rope to see where he was and found that the rope was slack. They had seen Eric 
below them not long ago, just minutes ago according to them, but they thought, you know what, maybe he somehow skirted us and reached the summit before we did, or maybe he's ahead of us on some other side of the mountain, so let's go to the summit and let's see if he's there. Eric was not there. And it's, you know, it's reasonable that they might think that because whatever had happened, Eric's heart, his, his actual carabiner at the bottom, at his section of the rope, was still there. So he had unclipped himself from the rope. He hadn't been ripped off of it or anything, he just unclipped himself. But since Eric wasn't at the summit, his two friends decided to descend down to Camp Muir, which is at 10,200 feet, to ask the rangers to go look for Eric. Search and rescue checked every possible route up and down from Eric's position and found nothing. There was no, no body, no Eric, no clothes, Nothing to suggest that Eric had ever even been on the mountain. That was until at 13,600 feet, just 400 feet below where Eric went missing, they found his pack, they found his climbing gear. They didn't find Eric, but they found all the stuff he needed to be on that mountain. And then at 13,800 feet, they found a weird little ice cave. So between Eric's pack and Eric's friends was a cave. Now, it doesn't appear that Eric was in the cave, but they could only get so far into the cave without risking injury, so they didn't go that deep, obviously. Of course, there are many accounts of this story that cite Politis that claim that the pack was found in the cave, but that does not seem to be the truth. And I also haven't read Politis's version of this story, so I'm not even sure that Politis said that, but I want to be clear that a lot of the accounts online do, and it does not appear to be true. As far as profile points go, Eric was older, he was in his 50s, he was male, he disappeared suddenly, there was no foul play suspected, he was near a cave, and he vanished completely. And as I said, he also must have removed his pack and detached himself before he disappeared. Nobody could find Eric, nobody had any motive to harm Eric, and nobody believed Eric had any intention of harming himself, so it, it crosses out most of the things that would explain what was going on here. Now, some people have said maybe Eric was never on the mountain, maybe, maybe his friends carried his pack up there with them, and that whatever had happened to Eric had happened before they got to the mountain. Why? Also, nobody could establish a motive. And then lastly, there are the cases I have described as true missing 411. The stuff that really has no reasonable explanation, and that kind of defies reasonable explanation, that, that makes everything about the case seem impossible. One of my favorite of these, one of the most intriguing, simply because of the man's story of his life, and I, I highly recommend that you go and you watch the, the full video on this case, it's about 40 minutes long, but Bart Schleier. This is a man whose job, whose, not only his job, but his education was in grizzly bears. His job was to track and monitor grizzly bears. He also did a stint in Russia tagging and tracking Siberian tigers. So not only was this man's job to hunt the most dangerous animals in the world, it was to hunt the most dangerous animals in the world and then apply tracking collars or tags to them and live. As you can imagine, a man who does this for a living kind of enjoys it, so he was up in Reed Lakes in the Yukon Territory where he was hunting for moose, which they themselves are one of the most dangerous non-predators that you can hunt. Aiden, please on the screen next to me will you place a graphic, a figure displaying the size of a man next to the size of a moose. He arrived there on September 14th, 2004, and he was supposed to stay for two weeks and then get picked up by the same float plane pilot who dropped him there in the first place. The float plane pilot arrived two weeks later on schedule. The problem was that Bart was not where he was supposed to be. In fact, Bart's camp looked like it had not actually been used all that much, and there was only evidence of one meal being eaten and no fire had been started. So whatever had happened to Bart, had happened two weeks earlier. For some reason, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police decided that Bart had left all of his gear behind and decided to hike to the nearest highway and just go home rather than staying the entire time. Of course, his friends pointed out that had he done that, he probably would have called somebody to let them know, and also nobody had seen Bart. His friends, basically seeing this as the RCMP just, you know, avoiding responsibility and not doing their job, decided to go investigate for themselves. They got there, they went looking, they realized that, you know what, yeah, his camp absolutely was not used. They, they were right about that. But his boat's not here. Where's his, where's his inflatable boat? Oh, look at that, it's on the other side of the lake. Well, let's go to the other side of the lake, start the boat, and here's Bart's remains. Now, what that tells us is that the RCMP basically went to the location, looked at it, took a couple pictures, said, eh, and went home. One thing I will say occurs in a, a large number of these stories is that when the federal police are involved, be it the RCMP or the FBI, they just don't do their jobs. They are not reliable, and I'm not sure why we're paying them. 
if you're gonna devote tax dollars to people whose job it is to fight crime or look for missing people, you would assume that they're going to do both of those things. They do neither. So, after Bart's friends did the investigation that the people paid to investigate things like this did not do, what they found was some of Bart's remains, his bow, his arrow, his gear, all of that, the RCMP did send a team back out to help, and they helped find some of this stuff. And then the Canadian Mounted Police decided, you know what, this was a bear attack. Now, why was this a bear attack? Because they really didn't have an explanation for anything at all. The only thing that suggested this was a bear attack was that there was bear scat in the area. There was also wolf scat in the area, to be clear. So, people took samples of that scat, which included some bone fragments, and they sent them off for investigation to be analyzed, and what came back was that the scat, first of all, did not have any, any human clothing in it, which is weird because bears do not wait for you to die and then undress you before they eat you. They eat you while you're alive kicking and screaming, and they will eat your clothes as well. It does not bother them. N neither does your kicking and screaming. So, like I said, no clothes, and a wildlife photographer in Alaska the year prior had also been eaten by a bear on camera, quite grisly, and his, his clothes were in the bear's stomach. So, when bears eat you, they eat your clothes too. It's, that's a pretty well-known fact. And as far as the bones go, I couldn't find any information on them, so it's pretty safe to assume that the bones were in fact not human, otherwise there would have been articles saying, hey, by the way, the bones are human. And on top of all of that, when bears make a kill, they, they typically eat until they're full, but Bart was a grown man, and the bear would have not finished Bart in one sitting. So they usually will hide the body somewhere under a tree, they'll dig out a little hole, it's called a cache and they will put their, their meal into the cache and come back for it later. There was not a single cache anywhere near where they found Bart's remains. Furthermore, with all of that considered, there was no sign of a struggle. Bart had weapons with him. It, it appears he did not use them. In fact, it appears that he, he never actually, while alive, got up off of the bag he was sitting on with his bow and his arrows next to him. And in order for all of this to be possible, the bear attack specifically, in order for this to be a grizzly bear attack, you'd have to assume that an 800 pound animal snuck up on a man whose job it was, his, his entire life revolved around that predator. And we're to believe that he didn't notice one coming up to him. And then we should add in another important fact here, which is that while the RCMP, who again, did not do their jobs at any point throughout this entire episode, by the way, we have more cases about Canada that we've covered, they're always doing this. They never do their jobs. And then I have Canadians commenting in those posts that are like, hey, yeah, by the way, this is normal up here. We never expect the RCMP to do their jobs. So when you have the RCMP, who we know are not doing their jobs and are not even expected to do their jobs at this point, saying that this was a bear attack, but Yukon Conservation Officer Kevin Johnstone is saying, and I quote, it's not characteristic of a bear mauling site, it's inconclusive how Mr. Schleyer would have died, you have to question the conversation and the narrative that this was a bear attack. Because this is, what we're looking at here is literally, man who hunts grizzly bears for a living is said to have been killed by a grizzly bear, but the grizzly bear expert says it probably wasn't a grizzly bear. So the two grizzly bear experts involved, the dead guy and the guy looking at the dead guy, clearly didn't think it was a grizzly bear. And because if Bart had thought there was a grizzly bear, he probably would not have died. And then you have the people who aren't doing their job saying it was definitely a grizzly bear, which also would be the sole explanation that allows them to not investigate. So what points are we talking about here? Well, Bart was older, he was male, he was highly intelligent, he was highly experienced, he was in excellent health, and very well equipped for his stay. He had everything he could possibly need to survive out there. So, so the odds that Bart died as a result of a grizzly bear attack, the odds against that are astronomical. So if not a grizzly bear, and obviously based on the condition of his body, not a heart attack, what happened to Bart? Well, there's really no good explanation. It just seems that something killed him and ripped his body apart. And for these kinds of cases, we, we can look at more. It's not just Bart. There's also Jim McGrogan. And Jim was a guy who was a doctor, he was in excellent physical condition, and he was just on a simple skiing and hiking trip in Vail, Colorado, one of the most traveled ski sites in the world. Between 9.30 and 10.30 a.m., the exact time period here is unclear, on March 14th, 2014, Jim McGrogan separated from his friends while on a hike to Isaman Hut. The trail they were on is just north of Vail, and again, a, a pretty popular one. Although determining exactly which trail he was on in the first place was a little bit of a challenge. Once again, we have a full video on this if you want to go check that out, where I explain all of it. 
His friends, who may have been in lesser shape than him, decided that they wanted to stop for a rest. Jim wasn't really feeling the rest and decided that he would go on and either meet them later when he decided to stop for a break and they would catch up to him, or he'd see them up at the hut. Now, one of the friends in a, an article about the story did say that they were upset with him about this because it was a guy's trip they'd been planning for a year, but there was no evidence that they were upset with him prior to this excursion. Well, his friends did reach Eisenman Hut around 5.30 p.m. that day, and you know who hadn't reached Eisenman Hut that day? Jim. They reported him missing immediately and discovered rather quickly that nobody had seen Jim. Nobody could remember seeing Jim. Nobody still on that mountain could remember seeing their friend that day. Despite dozens of search hours and two helicopters, Nobody could find any trace of Jim. They found tracks that led off the trail, but then went to a dead end. Or they found tracks, and they found whoever had left the tracks. There was no set of tracks that went off just somewhere else that could have been Jim's. And then, weeks later, in an area that had already been searched by air and by foot, a few backcountry skiers came across Jim's body. His head had sustained pretty severe trauma, such that his helmet was unrecoverable, his femur was broken, he had a number of other fall-related injuries, and in case you were wondering if he had fallen, he was at the base of a 700-foot cliff. Now, of course, falling off of a cliff while skiing is horribly tragic, but not an unfathomable possibility. The problem was, Jim was four and a half miles east of the trail that he had gone missing from. And more curious, there are no connecting routes between the trail he was on and the trail where he was found. Jim was also carrying a fully charged cell phone, avalanche beacons, and a GPS, and all of them were working. A actually, to, to make this even more odd, he had a spare cell phone battery. Like, he, he had two fully charged phones, essentially. And David Politis actually went to the trail where he went missing, and he had service. So, Jim would have had to ski or hike 4.5 miles in eight feet of snow, up and down several inclines of more than a thousand feet, across a creek, over the top of a cliff, with Vale, by the time he was at the top of the cliff, in fact, not even by that time, there were multiple points, but by the time he would have been at the top of that cliff, Vale would have been visible, and he had to do all of this without at any point realizing he was lost before he fell down a cliff. So, just, just to be clear here, between going as far as he did and not seeing the hut and not finding another trail, he would have also had to not check his GPS and not look down the mountain to see the lights from where Vale was, and he had to at no point in all of this think, hmm, I might have gotten off track. That's, that is so incredibly unlikely. Of course, an autopsy determined the obvious, Jim had died from a fall, but that was really the only thing that was accounted for here, and I, I ran into a lot more trouble finding details for this case than I have with any other closed case we've ever looked at. The police have actually been pretty straightforward in certain cases. In the case of Aaron Hedges, they were back and forth with me for a week. I, this is the first time I've ever been asked for a notarized form to get information about a closed case. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to get the form filled out, notarized, sent over, and then receive all of the information and look through it before the video had to go up. So when we eventually get the chance to do a full on the ground into thin air documentary on Jim McGrogan, I will fill out that form and we'll see what we can find. As far as Jim's profile points though, we're talking about a guy who is highly intelligent, he was a doctor, male, his point of separation made it basically impossible for him to vanish without leaving tracks or being seen. He either had to go up to Eisenman Hut on trail and then disappear from the top, down past his friends and have them not see him, or he had to leave the trail but leave no tracks. And then he ended up in a place he couldn't reasonably have gotten to with a fully charged working cell phone and GPS. And at no point, aside from about an hour after he left in what was referred to as a 16 second phone call, but it wasn't clear if that, it was referred to as a 16 second unanswered phone call. So I'm assuming that means he called, but nobody picked up. Aside from that, he never tried to contact anyone. And then for the last, like, actual look into a case that we're going to do for this video, there's Brandon Swanson, who is not a national park, not a wilderness disappearance. This one's just straight up weird. On May 13th, 2008, Brandon Swanson's freshman year at Minnesota West Community and Technical College in Canby, Minnesota, ended. Brandon, who is a resident of Marshall, a town about 30 miles to the southeast, and a graduate of Marshall High School, decided that he was going to stay in Canby for a little while, celebrate the end of the year with his friends, and then head home. 
and people who were at the party with him said that they had seen him consume a few alcoholic beverages, but not enough to be impaired, and that at no point did he seem incoherent or drunk. Of course, a lot of people have varying levels of tolerance, and some people can have had six to eight drinks and seem sober, while others can have one or two and seem drunk. Hard to say with Brandon, he was a little shorter than average, he was a little lighter than average, maybe he was not showing how much he was affected. Regardless, that only explains one of the points of this story. Brandon left Canby at midnight to go home. And while he may have started his drive on the, the highway, Route 68, that runs directly from Canby to Marshall, literally a straight shot, one road, he may have started on that road, but he didn't end up on that road. Sometime half an hour to an hour after midnight, Brandon called his parents and informed them that he had crashed his Chevy Lumina just, just north of Lind. Just outside of Lind, I think was the exact terminology used. Now, Lind was about seven miles southwest of Marshall, not a huge deal. Why he was anywhere near Lind is kind of odd, considering the fact that 68 does not go through Lind. But you know what, maybe he decided to take back roads and just ended up on a gravel and dirt back road near some farms, in between fields, and just the dirt road drove him off. Or maybe he was more drunk than he thought and he you know, lost control of the vehicle. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that he told his parents, I'm near Lind. His parents came looking near Lind and they did not find Brandon near Lind. Because everybody was getting a little bit frustrated, Brandon decided to, instead of waiting by his car, walk into town. He said he could see the lights of town and it was not that far and he was just gonna go there. And he would meet his dad at a bar, at, you know, somewhere where they, they knew where it was and they could just pick him up and head home. He stayed on the line with his dad throughout this walk to town. And during that call, he mentioned that he heard running water, he mentioned fields and he mentioned fences and that he was cutting through a field to get to Lind. He was a ways into this walk when he suddenly exclaimed, oh shit, and then nothing else, just dropped the phone. The phone, it does not appear, turned off. It sounds like he dropped the phone, his dad couldn't get a response, so his dad hung up and then called back and nobody answered. Whatever happened to Brandon happened very suddenly. Another twist to the story is that Brandon was not near Lind. He was near Taunton, which is like 16 miles from Lind. Not only that, but Brandon was still north of Route 68 and Lind is south of Route 68. Brandon had also said that he saw lights and that he was walking towards those. So initially, when they were looking for Brandon, when they found his car, they went towards Taunton, which was to the east, and you could see the grain elevator. You could see the light at the top of it, so he probably mistook that for Lind, and they thought, you know, maybe he's this way. However, the dogs tracked west towards Porter, which is another town that probably was not visible. The dogs also led them to a creek, to a river, and then up the other bank of the river, and then to a gravel road before losing the scent near an abandoned farm, which ended up becoming a kind of headquarters for the large search effort that followed. A search effort that has lasted basically over a decade at this point, because there are still people looking for Brandon. Despite the utterly massive amount of energy that was put into finding Brandon, he was never found. No trace of him, his cell phone wasn't found, his clothes weren't found, no remains, nothing. And we're talking a search area that has expanded to now be 140 square miles. It's massive. Other searches that are considered massive have been like 18 square miles. This is 140, this is almost 10 times as big. So what kind of profile points are we looking at? Well, he was young, he was male, he had a working cell phone, he was legally blind in one eye, so disability, he was near water, he totally disappeared, and dogs could not track his scent anywhere that helped. They basically were like, okay, well, we've actually tracked him east and we've tracked him west. He could only have gone one of those two directions in the time allotted. Now, as far as where Brandon was when he called outside of Taunton, well, that actually makes sense because Brandon had a prior DUI and if he had been caught drinking with any amount of alcohol in his system, that second conviction is, is much more intense. That's a, a much bigger problem especially for a 19 year old. So he probably took the back roads around these farms, which are typically in like one mile square grids, probably took the back roads, didn't quite realize that he wasn't as far towards Marshall as he thought, for some reason thought he had gotten south of Route 68, probably just confused, it was late at night, there's dust everywhere, these are gravel roads. His location, it, it's definitely a little weird for reasons I go into in the full video on this case, but the weirder part is the fact that there's no physical evidence of where Brandon ended up whatsoever. So now that we've broken down the various categories of missing 411 cases, we can kind of analyze David Politis, his approach, and the entire phenomenon. 
And my, my thoughts on this is David's a true believer. He, he's not a grifter. He's not a scammer. He genuinely believes in the stuff he's talking about, but he's covering hundreds, perhaps even thousands of cases, and statistically, mistakes are bound to occur. At the same time, there are occasions when David allows his confirmation bias to get the best of him. Another odd thing I noticed is that the fewer profile points that a case fits, typically the harder it is to explain. Some of the cases in that solved or weak category had more profile points hit than just about any of the cases in the strong or true missing 401 categories after I did my analysis. It seemed that cases with more and more points were less and less likely to actually be odd. As well, the most intriguing cases typically have some sort of X factor, something about the person who went missing, not just the circumstances of the disappearance, that made that disappearance strange. Things such as Bart Schleyer's experience in his field, Brandon Swanson's confusion about where he was, and the location of Jim McGrogan's body. These are all X factors. And with Jim McGrogan, that's more of an X factor regarding, you know, where he ended up, but there's also the fact that he was in very good shape and had all of the equipment and seemingly chose to use none of it. Furthermore, a considerable number of these cases become a lot less mysterious when you go back and reinvestigate and you analyze not just what David Politis says happened, but also the news reports, things that families said, other sources. I've, I've compiled a lot for all of these. As I've said before many, many times, I do all of my own research for these cases. I do not use David Politis. I do not use Strange Outdoors. I do not use, uh, you know, The Missing Enigma. I've used their same sources, but I've never just said what they've said. So for me, when I go back and I reinvestigate, a lot of the time I find that somebody else did not include details that should have been included or included details that did not have strong enough evidence. One such example would be that Politis claims that a lens cap from Stacey Aris's camera was found near the lake that she went missing by, but I couldn't find any evidence of that. All I could find was an actual official saying there was no evidence of what happened to her, and no evidence would include a camera lens. In some situations, the cases that are no longer mysterious are those like Bobby Bizup, who, as we know, was probably the victim of assault by a priest. There may be an unproven yet very likely reason, such as the case of Aaron Hedges and his alcohol withdrawal and drug use. The most intriguing cases also, oddly enough, have little in common with each other, but the cases that have strong evidence of something strange happening seem to be the ones that are the most similar to each other. So, for what I would call the majority of missing 411 cases, there, there does seem that there may be a thread underpinning all of these different cases, something that connects these strange, unsolved disappearances, but that thread may very well be the failure of law enforcement to adequately do its job in search and rescue operations. In a few of the cases, however, things that I mention as true missing 411, there's just so much there that doesn't make sense, that it really does seem like some sort of, I, I, I hesitate to use the term supernatural, but some something we don't yet understand, something preternatural perhaps is the better term, does seem like it could be at play. Now, whether you want to believe that that is a UFO abduction or being kidnapped by Sasquatch or something else, and again, kidnapped by Sasquatch in the way that we mean it is considerably less weird than kidnapped by Sasquatch in the way you might read on certain websites. It just feels like there's, there's a certain number of these that they're mixed in with a lot of stuff that is mysterious, but probably mundane, probably natural, probably human error. Mixed in with those are these ones that really just make no sense. And sometimes it's for lack of information. Sometimes it's because a kid named Casey down in North Carolina says that the, the bears or the wolves or the dogmen took care of him. Sometimes it's that Keith Parkins travels, I believe it was 12 miles in just 20 hours, and Les Stroud, the guy from Survivor Man, could barely do that when he tried it. It could even be Alfred Bielharts, who disappeared from the back of a line with all of his siblings as they were on a hike, and then somebody spotted a child screaming on a ledge 500 feet above where they were. Things that you're kind of like, I, I really don't know what's going on here. This does not make any sense, but there's a lot of people who want to say, oh, well, there has to be an explanation. And I I think that the failure is in assuming that there has to be a rational explanation based on our current understanding of the world. Things that are just basic science today would have been magic 500 years ago. Things that we constantly evolve to understand are things that would have been supernatural to our ancestors. 
So, are we looking at something where there's a worldly physical explanation? Possibly. Are we looking at something that we simply don't have the materials and the tools and the knowledge to understand yet? Also possibly. So I think it's foolish to say there must be a mundane, ordinary reason for every missing 411 disappearance, because we have to leave room for the existence of the unexplained, the unknown, and the extraordinary. However, it's also important to look at the missing 411 cases in a, a sort of rational lens and say, when something has evidence against it being unnatural, so to speak, we need to take that into account. We can't just keep ignoring things because it makes for a better story. And to be clear, I'm not accusing David Politis of ignoring things to make a better story. I'm just emphasizing the importance of peer review in these sort of situations. Maybe not academic peer review, but if you have other investigators go back and look through these same cases with the same materials, you can get to the answer quicker. So it would be great if, if David would make his sources available for everyone to see. If the goal is not just to make money, which I don't think it is for him, I think he genuinely cares, the best way to help is to make all of that information available so that other people can go and check it and recheck it and maybe catch things he didn't. And maybe catch things he didn't that prove something is totally normal, or they might catch things that prove his point that he never saw before. And I should recognize my, my own failures, because when I started talking about the missing 401 case, I was, I was more conspiratorial than David. I was saying, I think I know what's causing this, and you know what? The National Park Service actually probably was founded to, to deal with this. I don't necessarily believe that anymore. Now, do I think that the National Park Service may have been founded with the knowledge that some sort of, you know, Bigfoot-like creature exists out there? Yeah, I'm still willing to believe that one. I, I am still fully willing to believe that the National Park Service is aware that something weird is out there, but I'm not gonna claim that it's responsible for all of these disappearances. So, I guess at the end of the day, what I'm saying here is a lot of these missing 411 cases can be explained by rational reason. There's enough that are odd that I think it's worth looking into. And as far as my opinion on what David Politis is not saying, but also saying, I think he does think that something is responsible for a lot of these disappearances. I think that it is related to his work as a Bigfoot researcher. And I think that it's a little naive to suggest that he has no opinion on what might be causing this and that he's not trying to suggest subliminally or to hint at something physical being responsible. Part of the reason for that is that he does include the Sierra Camp tapes and, you know, Ron Moorhead and, and these guys who are pretty renowned Bigfoot researchers in Missing 401 The Hunted, and he doesn't really involve a case. He talks about some disappearances that happened 50 to 100 miles away, and then talks about this stuff that was going on in the mountains. I think he brought that in because he he does want you to make the connection in your mind between Missing 401 and Bigfoot. That said, I don't think he's necessarily saying that Missing 401 as a phenomenon world, you know, across the country, across the continent really, is necessarily Bigfoot, if that makes sense. That he, I think he believes in Bigfoot and he believes Bigfoot may be responsible for some of these cases, but I don't think he's claiming that Bigfoot is responsible for all of the Missing 401 cases. And to be perfectly honest, I haven't seen his new one, The UFO Connection, yet. But I'll watch that and let you guys know what I think, because obviously. With all of that said, if you like what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can support us by subscribing to our Patreon for just $1 a month, though there are higher tiers if you feel like supporting us even more. You can join this channel as a member, which does similar stuff, but you don't get merch. You can also catch this show live in what is obviously a slightly different format on Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. You can check out all of the other videos we mentioned in this video which should explain a lot more than just this video could, but I'm not gonna sit here like some other YouTubers and tell you that you've gotta watch a whole other playlist before you come watch this video, otherwise you won't understand it, like certain people. If you wanna support us and also get something out of it for yourself, you can check out our merch at thelorelodge.shop or you can buy our coffee from Tableau Roasting Company. It's called Mount Pocono Perk. It's delicious. It smells like heaven if heaven were a coffee roaster. You can also catch our podcast episodes on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to be more involved in the community, we have a Discord server. It's bit.ly slash join the lodge. And if you want to see me yell at the internet three days a week, you can come watch me over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash the Aiden Mattis, where I basically watch things that make me angry because they're bad conspiracies. And with all of those shout outs out of the way, I am Aiden Mattis and thank you for stopping by the Lore Lodge. <laughs>